Welcome to ACC Stars, Where Are They Now? I'm Erin Summers. I'm a sports broadcaster that's covered the Atlantic Coast Conference for over 10 years, and I grew up a fan. I've always been curious what players do after we obsess over them in college. This podcast answers that question. Each week, you'll hear an interview with a former ACC athlete. We'll find out everything they've been doing since playing in college. Thanks for listening. I'm super pumped to get this podcast started. Let's jump in to ACC stars. Where are they now? This week, I'm joined by former North Carolina forward and 2005 national champion, Jawad Williams. Williams averaged 13.1 points, four rebounds, and 1.4 assists his senior season and started every single one of the Tar Heels' 37 games during that championship run. Williams has accomplished quite a lot on and off the court since. Here's our conversation. Jawad, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start things off with how are you doing? And where are you calling in from? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm calling in from Sapporo, Japan. Uh, so the one on, on the northernmost island of uh, Japan, an uh, island called Hokkaido, city called Sapporo. That's pretty incredible that you're in Japan playing basketball, considering everything that's been going on with COVID-19. I know there was a hiatus for a little while. What does the season look like now? Well, we get ready to start the next We After we shut down the last season, which was March 29th, we're starting up the second season already, and we already have fans in the stands for preseason games. Uh, the facilities are not full, but we have a good amount of fans that show up to every game. And uh, right now, we, we're ready to go over here. You've had an incredibly long career playing professional basketball, but let's go back to where it all started. You're from Cleveland, Ohio. You have an extremely athletic family. What led you to play basketball? Uh, it actually came from watching my older sister play. My mom played. Uh, my older sister, she ended up playing at Vanderbilt. She played professionally in the ABL. And uh, that's where my passion came from, watching her play. And I was, you know, being drug around the city, watching her play in different leagues and everything like that. She dominated. Uh, I just wanted to be like her growing up. You were an AP Player of the Year, Gatorade Player of the Year for the state of Ohio. You played in the McDonald's All-American game. Why were you so good so early in your career? Uh, probably because of my background more than anything. Uh, come from a pretty tough background. Uh, my, my family, being athletic outside of just basketball, uh, come from a boxing background as well. My father was a professional boxer as well as my brother. They both were Golden Glove champions. And um, I just had a toughness about me that I was going to do whatever I wanted to do and I was going to do whatever I needed to do to be successful. And basketball was something I fell in love with early and I was willing to stick with it. Why did you decide to go to North Carolina? Well, I mean, a lot of people probably don't know this, but North Carolina wasn't my first choice. Uh, my first choice actually was Cincinnati. I really wanted to play for Bob Huggins. But at the time, they had a 0% graduation rate, and my parents were not having me go there. Um, my second option was Maryland, which I actually committed to Maryland and backed out of my commitment after a visit, after my official visit to Carolina. Uh, after that visit, I just felt like Carolina was the place for me to be. Uh, I was on my visit with Jackie Manuel. We clicked immediately, and uh, that kind of sealed the deal for me. You came into Carolina under head coach Matt Doherty. The transition from playing for Doherty to Roy Williams, what was that like? It wasn't that big of a transition. It was more so we needed to learn to mature as as a, a team. Uh, we were super talented. Uh, Coach Doherty recruited most of us. And, you know, we just needed to find a way to mature and grow together. And uh, when Coach Williams came in, he put everything in perspective and told us that it, we all did what we were supposed to do. Everyone would be successful. And that's kind of how everything happened. Yeah, in 2005, you won something called a national championship. Looking back on that year, what stands out to you the most? Uh, just our friendship, our bond. Uh, that bond is still strong to this day. Uh, we all communicate with each other on a daily basis, pretty much. Uh, everyone, our kids are growing up together. And that bond that we had back then is even stronger today. Who were some of your favorite players to play with or against in college? Uh, play with for sure. I mean, that, that's a hard list right there. You know, all my teammates were pretty much great. 
Uh, guys playing against, I would probably have to say Dan Ewing from Duke, uh, just because we've known each other since we were 14. Julius Hodge, same situation. We've known each other since we were kids playing the AAU ring. So probably those two guys uh, were the most fun to play against. Roy Williams, as a head basketball coach, what stands out to you about the way that he goes through his, his coaching and the way he cares about his players? Uh, first, coaching is attention to detail. Uh, he makes sure that everybody's on point with whatever, whatever job they're supposed to be doing, we're going to get it done uh, under him. And uh, as far as his care for his players, I mean, he made sure everybody was taken care of. I and mean, that goes beyond just playing at Carolina. I mean, I'm a guy who lives in the area. So I'm at Chapel, I'm at UNC Chapel Hill every day in the summertime. And I still have full run of the facilities and everything else I need. Um, and that's, you know, part of the culture that he helped build. What is it that has brought you back to Carolina and had you kind of established your life there? I never left. That was the thing. I never left. After I graduated, uh, Carolina has always been home base. Even when I played in, uh, Cleveland for the Cavs, I still had a home in, in, uh, Durham. So I never left. Uh, it was, I didn't, it's a great place to raise a family. My wife is from Mount Olive, North Carolina. So we stayed close to her family and, uh, it's just always been a second home for me. Everyone talks about the Carolina family. What does it mean to you? Uh, it means a lot. I mean, we got a, a group of guys who've been through the same struggles, you know, walking through, walk those same halls at Carolina. Um, and, uh, it's just the bond that we have. We able to grow together. Uh, that's the biggest thing. We're able to grow together. We have families. We get together consistently. Um, it, it means a lot. It means a lot to be a part of that family. After winning the national championship, what were some of your goals knowing that you had finished your college career? Um, well, of course, my goal was to get drafted. I mean, as every player's goal to hear his name on draft night. Um, you know, going leading up into that process, I was hearing that would be a late first, early second round pick, and then to not hear my name at all was kind of shocking. Um, but the last thing, I wasn't going to let it get me down. Uh, a lot of my family and friends around me, they were more upset than I was. I knew I was going to get there, which was going to take a little bit of time, and um, there's nothing new for me. I knew I was going to work my way through it. After you signed that free agent contract with the Clippers, you played a couple games. Uh, you ended up going overseas. What went into that decision to play overseas and – and why have you stayed so long? Um, I actually was over the NBA at that point. I got tired of being the last guy to get released from the roster. Um, that last stint with the Clippers, uh, cut time was 3 o'clock. I released at 2.30. Literally, I was the last guy to get released. And, I, you know, I got I was over it. I was just, you know, I'm ready to move on with my career. And I was like, well, the NBA may not be for me. And, uh I had been out of the country a couple of times. I've been out of the country once at that point. I was like, I had no problem going back over overseas and uh, making a life for myself, and that's what I did. You've been to so many different countries. What have been some of your favorite stops? Japan, of course. Uh, that's why I came back here. Uh, Turkey was great. Uh, France. I mean, I had a, I've, I've always been fortunate to live in great cities. I've lived in Paris, France, Athens, Greece, Reggio, Italy. Um, where else? I'm missing something. I've been so Jerusalem and Israel. I've been in so many different great places. It's hard to just pick one, but uh, Japan is definitely at the top of that list. Um, just because I'm so familiar with everything here. You've won several championships while playing overseas. Do two-time Japan League Championship, French Cup, Turkish Cup. How do those championships compare to winning the national championship here in the States? Uh, winning the national championship is, is a totally different thing because when I won then, it was over. Like, that was it. You know, you only – you put your name in the history books and it never changes. Uh, winning, out of the, winning out of the country and abroad is, is a little bit different, you know. On a professional level, you know, you win, it's great, people remember you, but it's not the same. It's not, it doesn't hold the same amount of weight as it does on the collegiate level. So are you saying that people still recognize you here in the United States? A little bit. No, <laughs> I get a, a few people recognize me every now and then. You have played for 16 years in professional basketball. How much longer do you want to play? I'm going till 40. Uh, when I turn 40, I'll probably hang it up. Um, 
I've already had people try to talk me into going a little bit longer, but I don't think my wife is going to have it. Uh, so probably at 40, I'll be done. Was that always your goal? Yes. I set that goal early. I'm a big believer in uh, speaking things into existence and, you know, being careful with the energy that I put out into the universe. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys say, when I turn 31, I'm done, and they get what they ask for. So I always said I'm going to play until 40 or until – I can't play anymore. I mean, it's, I only get to do this once. You know, once it's a once in a lifetime thing, and I plan on living it up. While you were overseas, you were reunited with some of your former teammates from Carolina, fellow national champions, David Noel and Sean May. How exciting was it to be able to play with them again? Well, that was very exciting. Uh, they kind of kicked that off. They did kick that off. Uh, after I left Cleveland, I had the option to either keep chasing my NBA dreams and making rosters on minimal contracts or I can go solidify myself in Europe. And they begged me every day to come play with him in Paris. He's like, it's Paris. He's kept telling me it's Paris. And I just talk to, talk to your wife about it. You know, we all know each other. We all went to school together and his wife called my wife. And then we just, it, it was Paris at the end of the day. So we ended up signing and going over there and they kind of led the way. He was a trailblazer in that aspect. And then when they went to another team, I recruited Sean. And we try to get as many guys as possible to come play with us in Paris. Our coach was all for us recruiting other Carolina guys. He wanted an all-Carolina roster. And we worked on it uh, until we couldn't do it anymore. Why was he so keen on Carolina players? Because he knew what type of characters he was going to get. Um, but outside of basketball, he knew we can handle living in Paris. You know, a lot of people can't handle living in a place like Paris. But we knew we were professional athletes. We knew we had to uh, – control ourselves and he knew like I said the characters he was going to get and um, when we couldn't get a Carolina guy we reached out and got other guys that we knew like I said before two guys that I reached out to and had them come play with me were Dan Ewing and Julius Hodge they ended up being my teammates as well and Elton Brown also from Virginia so I reached out to other ACC guys that I knew and trusted and I knew they could handle the work. So now you're on the same team as some of these ACC opponents. Was there ever any banter about some of those old games or times when you used to be on the opposite sides of the court? Oh, yeah, we, we still went at it. We always talked about, you know, what happened in college or who would have won this matchup or, you know, things like that, especially with Elton Brown. He was, he was a character, man. So his, his mouth got UVA in trouble a couple times against us. So <laughs> we just get him a pass every now and then to let him talk. How much fun is it for you to, to look out at the Carolina family and see all of these former Carolina players, the success that they've had, whether it's on the court as a player or possibly as a coach, like Sean May is now with Coach Williams, Carolina. I love it. I love it. Uh, especially the guys who are doing things outside of basketball. Uh, it's fun. Well, not outside of basketball, but outside of the court. You know, you got Jackie who, just took the job with the uh, UNC women's basketball program, Sean with the men's program. But then you got guys sprinkled everywhere. You got uh, Wes Miller, Jesse Holly's an AD in Texas. You got guys doing a lot of different things, and I think that's great for us. And um, we just got to continue to build our tree and you know, reach back and pick each other up. Speaking of Wes, I've heard this little rumor that he wants Roy Williams' job when Williams is done coaching at Carolina. I don't know if you heard the same thing. Uh, it's a possibility. I heard the same rumor. <laughs> uh, I think that that job is will be a lot of guys gunning for, and I believe Wes is in that conversation as well as some other great candidates like Jerry Stackhouse and some other guys. Uh, my hope is just that the job stays within the family. Simple as that. I don't want an outsider coming in and you know taking over because they probably just it's just to me they won't understand how things are supposed to work. You know, and how things have been running like clockwork there. Like, for myself, example, for example, I come back to Chapel Hill. I have free run of the facilities. I couldn't imagine somebody telling me, hey, you can't be in the gym at this time or, hey, you can't do this. I couldn't imagine it. So hopefully it stays within the family and uh, whoever gets it, I'll be happy for them. So basically you just want free run of the gym. So it's all about Pretty you. Much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm only one person. I know a lot of guys feel the exact same way. Uh, we all, we're all in there every summer, all day long. So we got to make sure we have things. We got to make sure it feels like home. That's all. What are some of those summer pickup games like? 
Uh, competitive. Uh, very, very competitive. You get to see matchups that you've never seen before. Uh, you know, that's the biggest thing. We push each other to be better. Uh, it's always fun going back and, you know, the younger guys think that you're too old to still play and things like that. And you got to put them in their place. And I, I love it. You know, this summer has, you know, put a, a freeze on everything because of COVID. We had to take the proper, uh, safety, take the proper, si- <clears throat> excuse me, take the proper safety tips and just stay away from each other. But, uh, other than that, those pickup games are legendary. You know, I've seen some matchups that I never thought I'd see before and, uh, probably won't get to see again. Can you share any of those matchups that really stand out to you? Uh, I'll never forget Ty versus Ray, uh, in the summertime. Uh, Shaman versus Ty. Shaman Williams versus Ty. Uh, let me think. Tyler Hansborough versus Sean. You know, we've seen all these things. Then you got myself going against Marvin, myself going against Harrison or Theo Pinson. Uh, it, it, I mean, the, you, you name it, they probably matched up at some point. And it, it's very personal because everybody has something to prove. Was the Theo one of those guys that was chirping at you? He kind of seems like somebody who would be talking some trash. <laughs> of course. Theo's always been that guy. But that's why I love Theo, though. I've loved Theo from the time he stepped on campus. Uh, he was always that guy who was running his mouth. And the next guy on my target on my list is uh, – Leaky Black. I've been I've been trying to get get that go after Leaky for a while now. I think he ducked me. <laughs> Why do you think that is? Because he know what he's getting into. <laughs> I think like people confuse people confuse what they've seen on TV TV with you know basketball with no restrictions. It's a totally different ball game. And uh, you know me and Leaky, I always call him out every time I see him. But we haven't had a chance to really match up. When we do, I'll I'll let him know what it is. Okay, you're gonna have to give us an update after that. Let us know no, if it no was uh, you that came out on top. It will be. It's not a question. <laughs> I'll tell you that now. I have a date for you, December twelfth, two thousand eight. Does that mean anything to you? December twelfth, two thousand eight. December twelfth, two thousand eight. Two thousand eight. Where were I you? Two thousand eight. I was in Cleveland. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. December 12th. December 12th. December 12th. Might have been the first game I played. Well, the first game I actually scored or something. I don't know. What was yes, it? that's right. The first game you oh, actually okay. you scored your first NBA points in. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that day is special to me. That moment. Um, I just remember checking into the game. Game was pretty much over. And I remember uh, Coach Mike Brown yelling, give him the ball. And then when I got it, I was like, I had to score. I'm like, this is first time I'm checking in, and I'm in front of my hometown, and I scored. But the best part about that is when I left the court uh, to meet my family in the back tunnel, my grandmother was there. And my grandmother hadn't been to a game probably in my entire life. And that was the first time she first time she seen me play was in the NBA game, and I scored my first NBA point. So that, that moment right there was pretty special for me. Speaking of being in your hometown, being able to play a few years in Cleveland had to have been pretty special. It was. It was. Uh, it just gave me a chance to be around my friends and family who I've been away from for so long because I was playing overseas and because I lived in North Carolina. I got to reconnect with a lot of people I grew up with. Uh, and the biggest thing for me was I always felt like that moment was more important for the kids in my, my neighborhood where I grew up. I spent most of my time down in my, my old neighborhood, not to show off, but to show kids that they can do it too. You know, um, they don't see too many NBA players walking around. And for me to actually grow up and uh, play in Glenville Rec Center and things like that, and they see me there every day, you know, I, I think it meant a lot to them. It's something that's stayed with you. You started a nonprofit. It strives to excel. It's right there on your T-shirt. What went into starting that? Uh, it actually started with my cousin. He had a quote on his senior pitches. You know, he used to do those back in the day. And it was, uh, strive to excel, never to equal. And that kind of just stuck with me. Um, and then as we got older, we started to brainstorm about how we can help other kids from our neighborhood and from other disadvantaged neighborhoods to become successful. And we went ahead and put in the paperwork and made it all official. And 
where we are today. What are some of the things that you've been able to accomplish? Uh, we've created scholarship funds for kids. We've created mentorship programs. We've done we've we've done basketball camps, and the basketball camps are more than just basketball. That we call it a basketball plus system. Basketball is just a debate to get the kids to come in, and then we sit there and we talk to them about real life issues. We have people from different walks of life come in and talk to the kids, not just basketball players, but we have police officers, judges. Uh, you think about it, we have them come in and speak to the kids. Uh, we've been able to do so much, and my next step is uh, I want to do affordable housing. So we're working towards that now. And it's all based in Cleveland? No, we do a lot of work in Durham as well. Um, anywhere that needs help. I mean, if I, if I have a connection there, I kind of tap into that connection and see what, what's needed, and we will move on from there. That's great. I really look forward to seeing what you're doing in Durham and keeping tabs on you in the triangle. Now, you are also a published author. You have been writing children's books. What inspired you to get into that field? Uh, just to leave a, leave something behind for my kids so they can look back on and be like, our dad did that for us. Um, my kids have lived a very different life. Uh, they grew up pretty much traveling the world with me, uh, especially Nyla. My oldest daughter, she's gone to school in Paris, uh, Japan, Athens, and homeschooled in Turkey. And Nash has been to school as well in Turkey and and Tokyo as well. So, you know, my kids are living a very different life. And uh, I just wanted to document everything for them and hopefully share their stories and encourage other kids to get out and travel the world. Because that's the biggest, that's the greatest form of education is being able to be exposed to different cultures and different things. How many more books do you have in you? Well, I got two more so far on this Nyla and Nash uh, series. Um, I'm working on my autobiography as well. And I know I'm going to have to come up with something for my twins when they get older and they look back and realize they don't have a book. That could be an issue. So I'm uh, working on a book for them as well. What is going to be the focus of your autobiography besides you? <laughs> Just, just tell them my story. Um, a lot of people don't really, they get caught up in, they forget that there was a life before Carolina basketball. That's how most people know me. Uh, there was a life before the Cleveland Cavaliers. It, it was a process getting to that point. Um, they don't know about me growing up on St. Clair and Eddie Rowe in Cleveland, Ohio. And, uh, you know, that, the trouble that brought, uh, just trying to survive everyday life and, and make it. And, uh, People don't know that story. I feel like a lot of people can relate to it, especially the kids who grew up in my neighborhood. I know they can relate to it. I feel like it needs to be put on paper. What are some of those challenges that you dealt with growing up? Um, well, we grew up in the inner city of Cleveland, which is, if you know anything about Cleveland, outside of uh, Quick and Longs Arena or whatever it's called now, uh, it's, a, it's a totally different world. Um, it's a pretty tough neighborhood. Uh, it's just, it's not for the, the weak hearted. You know what I mean? It took a lot for me to persevere to get out of there. And, uh, for example, for me to get to high school every day, I had to get up at 515 every morning and take an hour and a half bus ride just to get to high school. Cause I couldn't go to my local high school. I could have, but I don't think it would have benefited me, uh, being in that environment and, you know, with so many traps that I could have fell into. So you touched on Cleveland, but didn't really get into the team that you played on there. What were some of the moments that stood out, maybe some of the players that stand out to you from that Cavaliers team? Uh, well, first, I think a lot of people know I played with LeBron for two years. So, uh, yeah, I was going to let something. you bring that up. This is about yeah, you, not yeah. LeBron. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you know, everybody, that's, everybody's talking point. But, yeah, I played with LeBron for two years, played with Shaq for one year, got the team up with a couple of Carolina guys and Danny Green and uh, Antoine Jameson for a little bit. Um, those teams were very special. Uh, everybody that I knew that played in the NBA as well was telling me that wasn't real life simply because we all got along. Uh, usually when money gets involved, uh, guys become distant and selfish, but that team, those, those teams and those units that I played with, we never had any issues and everything was smooth. Do you ever tell your kids that daddy played with LeBron? They know. They know. They, they, I have the old 2K games, and they pull them up, and they play with me all the time on the game. So they know, and they've seen pictures of me and LeBron together. Uh, Nyla, my oldest daughter, she's met them a couple times. So, yeah, they know. 
to you when you look at a player like that, what is it that's made him so special? Uh, probably his work ethic. I can remember vividly, like, those days when I was in Cleveland, I was always showing up. Now I'm the 15th guy on the roster at the time. I was showing up two hours early to, you know, eat breakfast, work out before practice and everything. And he was showing up an hour and a half. So he was getting there 30 minutes after I would get there and we would work out together. Um, that really stood out. I mean, he's a guy who he can just walk on the court whenever he got ready and still be probably the most talented player in the world. But he actually put in the work and, uh, that was something to see and you know, it was something to model myself after. Have any of your kids gotten into playing sports or shown interest in a particular sport as they've been growing up? Uh, my oldest, Nyla, she's heavy into soccer. So I think she will stick with soccer as long as possible. My son, my five-year-old son, Nash, she's big into uh, basketball, but he's also picking up football a lot lately. He's been talking about he wants to play football. I'm not sure I'm going to let him do that. Uh, probably stick him in flag football for a while. You know, I don't want him to, I have too many friends that, are, you know, suffering now from the football that they played at young ages. So I'm going to keep him away from the, you know, hard contact sports for a little bit. But, uh, those two so far, soccer and soccer, basketball and football. What are your thoughts on allowing all of the teams that play into the NCAA tournament? Nah, that defeats the purpose. <laughs> that defeats the purpose. Uh, that's a participation award. I'm not not big on those. Like, you have to earn that spot. You know, we should earn the right to actually be able to play in the tournament. I mean, just make it. Because anybody can get there and get lucky for one night. If you're 0-22 and, and then you make the tournament and then knock off the number one seed, that's just terrible. Like, nobody wants to see that. So, yeah, I don't, I'm not for the participation awards. You have done so much in the basketball world as an author as a nonprofit, what are some of your other goals that you want to achieve? I don't know. I got my hands in, I want to get my hands in so many different things. Uh, I want to get in to real estate, uh, developing real estate. I want to get into, it's just so many things. I, I'm, I'm knocking things off my list. I wanted to become an author. I did that. Now I'm just finding new things to get myself into. And, and it's moving along. And the biggest thing is I want to make sure I leave a legacy behind for my children, my family, and other kids, a blueprint for them to follow to be successful. Looking back on your basketball career, your life, what is what you would consider your biggest accomplishment? Uh, for sure, the family, the family that I've been able to raise. Um, I have a wife. We've been married for 11 years now. Um, I have four children. You know, that's, that's an accomplishment in, in itself. Um, but that's my biggest accomplishment for sure, is being able to raise a beautiful, healthy family. I really appreciate you talking to me. It's been really fun catching up, hearing about what you've been doing since Carolina. And I wish you the best of luck in the future and on your way to playing at 40. Thanks, Erin. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure you head to accsportspodcast.com each week for the latest episode or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.